Okay, so I'm here to introduce uh, you to, uh, to our next person. Um, Jordan is here to give his graduate lecture and I'm handing it over to Lisa. Thank you so much, Bree, and welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm Lisa Jarrett, and I'm introducing the graduate lectures and talks over the course of Assembly TV 2021. It is my pleasure to introduce to you MFA candidate in art and social practice, Jordan Rosenblum. Jordan works as a socially engaged artist, designer, and educator. His projects draw on all three roles integrating pedagogy into his creative practice and using common forms of public communication, such as signed systems and maps as educational tools. Jordan teaches in the School of Art and Design at Portland State University and co-directs Recess Design Studio in affiliation with the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School Museum of Contemporary Art or Chaos Mocha. As an artist, uh, this project explores the power of design with elementary school students. Jordan will be discussing work from the past three years today, focusing on participatory projects that explore how we make meaning of our environments. Welcome, Jordan. We look forward to hearing about your graduate project and talk. Sweet. Thank you, Bree, and thank you, Lisa, for that welcome. Here we go. Great. Uh, super glad to be here and really appreciating you folks showing up. Excited about giving this presentation. It's kind of a big one. It covers a lot of material. I'll do my best to not be verbose and um, I will stay within the time limit. And with that, I will uh, kick it off. So the talk I'm giving today is called Getting to Know the Place. And um, I'm gonna speak through a number of projects that are about the relationship people have to place and the ways of working with that and thinking about it. And with that, I will load my presentation and take it from there. We'll have to do the requisite test, making sure it works. All right, here we go. Apologies, one moment. Are you all able to see that? Full screen presentation happening? Excellent. Yes, it looks great. Great, good to know. Thanks, Bri. Excellent. Um, so my name is Jordan Rosenblum. I got that introduction from Lisa. And with that, here we go. Yeah, so something I'm really thinking about in this work is how we make meaning of places. And, and with that, kind of kicking this off with a little bit of a prompt, which is what's your favorite place in the world? Probably not, will not respond two chats, but would love to see them if you wanted to post for you folks who are in Zoom. We'd be thrilled to see that. Super curious. And it's a lead in to kind of think about our relationship to place and what that could mean. The first project I'm going to talk about is, oh, well, I love me seeing it. See, now I am focused on them. That's going to be really hard. This is why I don't ask questions during this. Strassel Farm uh, is the first project I'm gonna talk about. And what this is, is the Strassel Farm Artist Residency. In 2019, I spent some time on the foothills of the Cascade Range here in Oregon. And it's an artist residency that was started by the artists, Robert Chambers and um, Meta Tamarup. And it was a place that was extremely beautiful and the land there was lived in and utilized for 14,000 years by the Kalapuyan people who still live in the area and also are the part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde. This is an image from the 
site called Strassel Farm. And what you're seeing here is an ecotone where there's an edge of a hay field that's kind of beaten up and this forested strip in the front. And I'm really interested in that kind of detail. Here's the farmhouse. So showing up, I came to this residency and, and really the first thing that happened is I started walking around. When I had come to the residency, I initially had proposed a project that involved this dynamic, large scale proposal with bringing different people in to think about value on the site. But the way I first showed up was by walking. This is a piece of a forest succession that's happening from a logged area of the farm. And you can see this growth coming back in. It had railroad tracks that were super overgrown. And I also spent time with these kind of more intimate details of the land. This is an orchard that has rewilded itself. Some bear scat and a lobster mushroom. And this was harvested um, by Janice, the nearest neighbor. And I spent a lot of time with her doing things like walking, hiking trails that had been grown over and reestablishing them. And the reason I'm talking about all of this is this was my kind of method or strategy for getting to know the place, really coming in and hanging around. What came out of that was a number of smaller projects. So this first one is called Translating Bird Talk. I'm an avid birder. I love birding and I know nothing about birds. And so this project kind of came out of that paradox where the way I'd go birding was pretty typical. Where I would show up with a bird book, listen to the call, hope to see them and work to identify them. But one day on the property, I decided not to take my book with me. And instead, what I did was just start listening to the sound of birds and associating. I didn't even know I was doing it until a good ways in. And what it became was really part of a daily practice in which I'd go out without a bird book, listen, and I began to write poetry with these translations of bird sounds that I was hearing. Another project that came out of it was called Making a Walking Stick. This was a collaborative project with Durbin Dorsch, whose name I misspelled there, I'll have to correct that. And Durbin was, I believe, 11 years old at the time. And a number of things happened at the residency, one of which these kind of unexpected and spontaneous collaborations. Durbin's really, really rad. And she had this practice of um, creating walking sticks. She had this real love of walking sticks. And she came up with this activity that was pretty direct, what it consisted of walking in the woods, finding a stick that you like, cleaning it up a little bit, removing the bark. There's an optional step of sanding it down. And um, walking with it is the final step of the project. That's Durbin collecting sticks. I was also gifted at the end of this my own walking stick from her, which was so nice. And I'm actually not seeing myself, but that might be it in the corner, if you can see where I'm pointing. Um, so still living with it. The reason I'm bringing up those two specific projects also that came out of this was really thinking about this intimate level of detail and these direct ways of engaging something and how that came to me or kind of like I started to develop an artistic or creative practice based upon just showing up, hanging around and seeing what happened. Through that, this theme started to emerge, which I was calling being a guest of the land. One of the reasons for that was the easiest, most obvious one, which is that I was a guest there. I was going to be there for a month or two, knew very little about the site and um, was really a guest. The other thing that was happening is that the space was being rented as an Airbnb and things would happen like I'd be gone for a week in the summer and during that time it would be rented out. And so I became really interested in this idea of engaging other visitors and guests to the site. And I created this series of notebooks and a field guide. And what the field guide was, was it consisted of a number of these activities, the bird song, the um, walking stick exercise, and a host of other ones. And I left these field guides there that people could take with them and explore the property. 
maybe the culminating project from that time, and this was with, I developed, was a community board with Durbin and her sister Peyton Dorsch. And this came about because I had this board in my studio in this old drafty barn in which I was just collecting ephemera and making notes and hanging things up to check out. And I was working on something with Peyton in the barn and she, the day before she had gotten stung by a wasp and she was talking about that being a really hard experience. And we started to talk about how, why would we want to communicate that publicly or how? And so we repurposed this board into a community board. And what that looked like was we posted a whole number of things on it that seemed like important information. There's Peyton's sign about wasps. And what it also allowed me to do was create this container that could hold all these other elements, the books and the guides to activities and the tools you might need to do some of them. Brief pause for another one. So the next question I'd ask is, what's the most damaged place you've ever been to? Oh, Bree, you're going dark. I see that in my own soul. Um, the land I'm looking at Strassel and was talking about is extremely beautiful. And there's also a lot of damage there. There's this long relationship between um, the land itself and the people who have tended it, much of which is good and some of which has been destructive and is really challenging. And I'm really interested in these spaces that hold pieces of history and are beautiful in their own right, and also really damaged. The next project is called Interpreting Place. And this was a class that I co-taught and developed at Portland State University for undergraduates in the graphic design program. And I developed it with Mariah Berlanga Shevchuk, who's my collaborator on it. And so this class itself here are the students, um, the participants as it were, and the class itself was oriented towards this one specific site in Oregon that's called the Five Oaks Historic Site. This site also is on Kalapuyan land, unceded Kalapuyan land. And the site itself has a deep, long um, native history. And then more recently was an important place for fur trading between peoples and was the first place in the whole Oregon territory that a 4th of July festival was held. This is the drive up to the site, which is essentially disguised. You can see that one little top canopy of the trees. This is the earliest known uh, photograph of the site from, 19, from the 1920s. And here it is today. Here's a group of students out there. And one of the things we were really talking about was how you engage a public with getting to know a place. The way we worked with it with this group of students, we, we did a ton of sketching and drawing as a way of thinking about interpretation and the kind of experiences that could happen at the site to kind of prompt people in to ways of engaging this space, the space that is an office park and a business park that also has a 500 year old tree and that has this rich history that in a lot of ways is invisible um, to the eye. The idea of contextualizing it as a gathering space was also really important to us. That's what it's been historically. And the idea of being able to create experiences that would make sure that that was being accommodated for. the last question, I believe, of this presentation, which is what's the most historic place you've been to? These are beautiful. It's like we're getting this like endlessly esoteric stream of responses, which fits me, so that's working well. This next project is called Non-Historic Homes or Place Biographies. 
this came out of that class, the interpreting plays class. And at first run, it was almost a, um, like a byproduct, meaning we used a number of exercises in order to create a connection between this very unglamorous historical site and students' individual connections, trying to kind of bridge that divide. So this starts off with asking people to sketch a home of theirs that they've lived in at some point. Predominantly people worked with childhood homes and the idea was just to start getting kind of in a position to think about it. And from there, um, we wrote really brief 100 or 150 word historical markers. And if you're familiar with a historical marker, it's um, an indicator of a historic place that generally a civic society or municipal organization has deemed historic. And they're often in front of buildings. So working with students, what they started to do was develop these ideas of a historical marker. They drew on personal memory and experience. They drew on the neighborhood context that existed. And they also thought about how it informed their current lives. So looking at this kind of matrix of different ideas of understanding a place. We then went and had signs fabricated. And what this is was actually an extension that happened after the class had ended. So this project had continued to go on and continues to go on to this day. We offered these manufactured placards to students. This is Roxy Rasbo in front of her childhood home in Portland. I met her and brought her the sign. And one of the things that happened through that experience is she just started telling me about the site. And it was all these levels of detail that kind of hadn't been touched on. And so some of it, I remember that her putting her hands up with her talking about a garage that had been physically lifted and moved hundred feet and put back down. She talked about this tree that perennially has a family of woodpeckers who come back and talked about all these details of the landscaping and the relationships between her family members and the property. So as we approach the front door, you can see that historical marker hanging out up there, right above the welcome sign into the home. Oh yes, this is my plug. Um, so this project is ongoing and on Friday, I'm now working with my collaborator, Laura Glazer, um, in which we'll be developing place biographies with these non-historical markers with the public. So you're welcome to come to that. We'd love to see you there. I have an ongoing project that I started three years ago with my collaborator, Kim Sutherland, called the Recess Design Studio. In that project, we work with a host of different kinds of things that involves typography with uh, elementary school students. These are fourth, fifth, and third, fourth, and fifth grade students. And it's launched a number of projects. What I'll talk about here is called What's Up With My Block. We tackle two aspects, one of which is the formal language of design and kind of design education and experimenting with that. And another one is thinking about interpreting and reinterpreting our environments. And so using this word interpretation again to explore how we understand the place that we find ourselves in and what that layer is between the place itself and us. We're constantly creating these open interpretations as people and in our environments, there are interpretations happening all the time. Even something like this. So a historical marker is one very obvious way of thinking about it. And another way of thinking about it is another simple form, which is a map. So we worked with third, fourth, and fifth graders in developing these small maps that involved a walk around their block. 
we left it really open-ended, but we phrased it in a couple of ways. We thought about this, again, this matrix of experiences that make a place and asked the students to determine for themselves what they felt was important to be communicated in these frameworks. So on one side of the map was these illustrations. This is Joanna's, which I really like. And she had chosen specific details that she wanted to call out from the project. And on the re reverse side are the actual labels that associated with them. This was a visual map and she also had all of these cues about the audio landscape and what was important to her in terms of her daily life of hearing it and being there. The one on the left reads the abandoned house. The abandoned house is a building at the end of the street that has nobody in it. It's abandoned, again, pretty self-explanatory. My personal connection to this project after the fact was she gave me a copy of the map and I took myself on a self-guided tour of the block. These are photographs I took along the way of some of the elements that she had discussed. And what I liked about that personally was that I was playing with an idea of interpretation that was one more level. There's a map maker, there's the map, and then there's the person taking a tour with the map. And of course, my own experience is being overlaid into all these different layers of how we understand a place and how that's communicated between one person and another. I'm going to pause my share for just one moment. Please hold for one moment and we'll be back in action. Are you Addressing Hunter by chance? I am not. Is Hunter okay. having an issue getting in still? Yeah, but I, I think I got it worked out. Great, thank you. Separate, uh, separate minor emergency. Great. Sweet, thank you for allowing me uh, to make this quick digression. And you able to see this again? Excellent. Another project I'll talk about is called New School Signs. This also spun out of a project that started in the recess design class. Project began with a group of students walking around the school. We began to identify and make notes of everything we saw. Any sign, everything that we were understanding as interpretation. Um, and all of the elements that kind of constructed the school at that layer. We made a list, we made a really big list. So each of the students came up with sheets of paper that identified all of the aspects. We also began to take an index of all the vernacular, the kind of style of signs and how they functioned as a design layer on top of it. What we asked students to do next was to decide what sign they wanted to make. So it was a wide open prompt. And what we were asking them to do was to identify something which they wanted to interpret. One of the signs is referred to as Kids Lounge Yay. And Naomi, one of the people we worked with, wrote this one. Naomi was really interested in one place 
in the library in particular. On the left, you'll see her original sketch for it. This is the approach to the space that she was thinking about, which is this upstairs, um, this upstairs area kind of in a perch in the library at the King School. So I should mention that this project is happening at the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School in Northeast Portland. And if I didn't mention it earlier, this is also a project that's housed in the school and affiliated with the King School Museum of Contemporary Art, of which Harold Fletcher and Lisa Jarrett are the co-founders and original artists. As you approach it, there's this little sign on the side. So the kids lounge. What the sign starts to do is engage the meaning of that space from Naomi's perspective. That there's a naming that happens within that context that obviously traditionally would not be there. My hope is that within a year, everyone will be referring to it as the kids lounge or even better as the kids lounge, yay. And in creating these signs, really what we did was we also looked at this idea of a sign vernacular. What are the signs that exist in the school? What era are they from? And whose voice are they? And thinking about voice is really important in this project. Often what we see with signs is that there's an, there's an authoritative voice happening especially within a context of a school where there's this dramatic age differential um, as well as power differential. The second sign that was developed through it is called Don't Use for Target Practice by Miles. We rocked around the school um, what Miles identified was a door to the outside that had a series of small BB holes in it through the glass panes. And on the right was his sign that he originally drew, don't use for target practice. If you look to the upper panes on the left and the right, you'll see those BB holes. And you'll see that the way that this sign integrates or doesn't integrate into all the other existing panels. And the side-by-side -side comparison of the two. What's happening is we're also trying to pull in aspects of the vernacular or design from the students into these official signs as a referential piece back to the original. This was actually kind of challenging. When I say us, I actually don't mean the students in this case. So this project was started right before the pandemic. And so there was this whole other layer that kind of happened without them. Um, taking their signs and then choosing how to make these official ones, which raised all kinds of additional questions for me about agency within the scope of this project and how that works with younger folks. It's something that comes up a lot in our work with recess in general. And I think as a pension, as someone who is a graphic designer, there's also a tension with that in terms of a, a sense of finality or finish kind of against letting the thing be what it is. Another one that came out of this is called the quiet game zone with sincere. Although the emphasis, I'm not quite sure whether it's quiet game zone or quiet game zone, which is something I still play with each time I think about it. So in this context, what happened was that as we were taking this tour, um, we kind of took a pause for a moment and Sincere and I started talking about this one area. We had kind of stumbled into a corridor that is not often used in the school. And 
we began to think about how to activate it. I don't think that's the language we used at the time. I think we just spontaneously actually started to play a game. And what that game was this Simon Says-ish project that involved one person trying to emulate the movements of another and that first person trying to move in a way that would prohibit the second person from following them. So we essentially started to mirror each other. And if you look dead in the center of that space, and there are the rules for the game. The final rules are no talking, be safe, have fun, and good luck, which I really love. Um, there's also a clear ending, which says the game ends when one person gently touches the other. And so part of the part was also the idea of creating a kind of appropriate game that could be played within the space in terms of sound. So it was this way of activating this quiet space that wasn't used that would allow it to still retain that character. Another sign that came out of the project is called the anonymous note wall. This was a sign that was developed by Joanna. And here we are back again in the library. You'll see that that kind of green hexagonal element is where the kid lounges on top. If you look straight ahead, you'll see that little like white and pink thing way back in there. So this sign is located within the library and in this very dark corner. And then that open doorway to the right of it is the teacher's lounge. And on it, there's a very curled, very old sign that basically says teachers only on it. And the sign itself engages that same typographic element you'll see in the word anonymous, which has this squiggly form that Joanna had originally come up with and is a space where people can leave notes for teachers. What I really love about this one is it's exploring a, a, a different kind of interpretation. We've moved on from this original pieces that were really about um, perspective, which we are really interested in exploring, perspective with the students, but then moving into giving another form of an interpretive layer, where in this case, what Joanna was playing with was creating an element that would allow other people to fill it. I will also say about this, this is also a pandemic option where I wrote those notes on this anonymous note place in a very strange attempt at replicating what a nine-year-old might have posted. It was probably the hardest thing in all of the projects I've shown today. I was like, what would they write? I don't know. And I don't want them to be like mean, but I don't even know who's like, what are we going to do here? And I actually had some conversations with my collaborator, Laura Glazer, about this, where um, one of the struggles that I'm thinking about, or I, sh I shouldn't call it a struggle, but there's tension between what a student wants to say or what they mean by this experience and what I think is okay. And so what I start to see is like a creeping in of this uh, parental layer of control. And what that means is I want to put a little label that says, don't be mean on it. And Laura was like, she didn't write, don't be mean. Why would you put that on there? And what I saw was that I had this inclination to kind of start making it more appropriate. But that wasn't the point. The point wasn't to make a space where appropriate things could be said necessarily. I am going to pause the share again for just a moment. I'm going to ask right now, I'm going to take a little bit of a break just for five minutes and kind of look you all in the eye in the Zoom room and just ask 
if any questions have come up so far. There'll be some more time at the end. It's okay if there aren't. Jordan, I have a question. Please. Did any of the kids want to make signs in languages other than English? It's a great question. It did not come up when we worked on it. Cool. Yeah. I had an, this is a kind of like totally side topic, but I'll just let myself go there, which is that um, Ilya, who presented earlier in the day and is another artist uh, who also works with KS Mocha, we were just recently speaking about it because there's a student in here, Miles, who I talked about earlier, who did the don't use for target practice sign, who has also developed his own language. Ilya worked with him on a project where he developed this whole coded visual language. And um, Ilya had been working on a project that involved um, redoing all of the school signs in this coded language. And so it became this interesting conversation. This doesn't speak to inclusiveness or accessibility insofar as we might want a sign that was in another language or multiple languages. And in fact, almost did something completely different, right? Which made it less accessible or accessible to people who had a, a key, a code key to work off of. Okay. I'm gonna be like fully transparent about what's happening right this moment. This is like wildly inappropriate. Uh, <laughs> I went through that. I'm usually extremely verbose and I was very concise and I went way too, I like took out half of the content and now I find myself here with 10 more minutes than I need. Um, and so I'm going back through to see if there's another one that I can pull forward of the four or five projects that I've removed from this talk. Um, and I will be able to find that shortly. And if not, I can wrap this portion up and open it up to a, a longer conversation of which I totally welcome. Jordan, would you like to move into q and I think that there are some questions in the chat. Um, awesome. Aaron Kohler asks if you could tell us more about, um, hold on, a Zoom thing came up, about the Five Oaks project. Yes. Um, would you be willing to do that? I would be thrilled Great. to do that. Um, so the Five Oaks project itself started off as a class, like I mentioned. There's actually this very peculiar linkage that launched it. Um, maybe I can tell that story for a moment. Um, I think that's kind of an interesting context also just to think about this way of working and how, um, to think about this way of working as an artist and to understand this work, which I, is participatory, right? Where you're working with uh, content and you're also working with groups of people to create things. When I was finishing Strassel Farm and through Strassel Farm, I was doing this archival research about that project. And what it linked in was it brought me to the Five Oaks Museum. So it's this wonderful museum that's doing really, really interesting work out in Washington County. It's obviously named related to the Five Oaks historic site. At any rate, I went to this museum to do this archival research and became friendly with the staff there and familiar with the work that the museum was doing. One year later, jump forward, um, I am driving out to the area to go meet my friend Landon. And I take two wrong turns and I end up in this, sorry, Karen, I'm going like way off, but we'll, I'll write it back in. So I take two wrong turns and I end up in this parking lot. And what that is, is the Five Oaks historic site. I'd never been there, I'd been meaning to go. And it was just like really interesting and surprise thing. I kind of took a selfie and then sent it to Nat Andrini, who is uh, uh, one of the co-directors with Molly Alloy of the Five Oaks Museum. Okay, so I take a selfie with the trees. I'm like totally amused by this get back on the highway and just a quarter mile across the road, I meet my friend Landon. I start asking him because you can see the trees from the top of it. And Landon um, just start asking questions. And I'm like, do you know what those trees are? And Landon is like, yeah, it's the Five Oaks, blah, 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 blah. I used to live down the road and I used to farm that property. 
Um, his family has been farming in the Willamette Valley for generations, and it was this really interesting tie into the site. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up, and coincidentally, I was meeting Matt and Dreamy the next day to hang out and go crabbing. And this whole topic came up and this idea of interpretation and of the site and its current contexts and how strange it is. And kind of on the spot, we decided it makes sense to do a class about it, to really explore this idea of interpretation with a really rich and complicated subject of the site. So Karen, that's the, the origin of it. And then the class itself was really kind of a 10 week experiment in how we interpret something. And there was a design aspect that had to do with exhibition design. And there were all these other facets that were really about the process. And I work a lot, number, numerous of these projects are really about are, are taking class, taking place in classroom contexts. I'm gonna to try to slow down. The reason in part why that's happening is for me, it's an excuse to explore process. There's a lot of kind of forgiveness in education around exploring process because in so many ways, that's what we're doing in the classroom. And so that class really became focused on a process of interpretation and of exploring these linkages between how we understand history, what gets emphasized in how history is created and how our own experiences inform these definitions of a place. And so the Five Oaks class itself, one way of thinking about it is, you know, we had students do drawings of their favorite trees in order to connect with the Five Oaks trees themselves. Um, we had them create these historical markers that contextually were about developing these specific histories of place and also just seeing the way that complexity um, kind of came together. A follow-up question to that, Jordan. Please. Um, could you could you talk a little bit about the either similarities or differences between collaborating with um, adults, for example, within the Five Oaks project um, versus collaborating with children, either at Dr. MLK Junior School or at Strassel Park? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I think it might play on the, the tensions I was bringing up when I was talking about creating those signs for the new school signs project at MLK. Those tensions between kind of my role and authority and the voice of authority and a censoring voice in a lot of ways comes up often when I'm working with youth. Um, and it really depends on the context that I'm working with you. So also just to see that and how that plays out in my system. For example, when I was working with Durbin Dorsch at Strassel Farm, um, I never, at, at 11 years old, I never once thought about changing her project, the walking stick project or anything else we discussed. I really helped facilitate that um, openly and there wasn't a tension with that for me. And I think in part because it wasn't happening in an institution. And so there's that creep, I think, of a sense of responsibility in my role. So those are thinking about it in two different contexts. Um, man, if I follow this thread, I also have seen that, that same tension actually with adults as well. But that's kind of a separate thing but maybe worth talking about, which is thinking about history and truth in history, right? How history is written, whose stories are being told, of course, and whose voice are sharing those stories. And the complexity of that ratchet is, ratchets up a lot in some ways when I'm working with adults. And that's a became almost a primary concern when we were working with the Five Oaks class, because we are really dealing with content. And some of these other projects that I'm talking about, such as the Historic Marker Project, is about individual content. People can develop what they want. So there's all these kind of 
nexus points, I think, of thinking about this. And, and really, at least in a lot of ways, it's about agency. I don't have a clear answer for that, but that's kind of where, where I go with it. Thanks, Jordan. I have a follow-up, but I'll leave space for other folks if there are other questions. I am also happy to talk about one other project if we want to uh, open that up and we have a moment. All right. So, um, one other project that I worked with, I'm gonna share my screen again, because obviously I was able to find these slides. So that's a good thing. Start this up. Here we go. All right, y'all seeing that? Great. So one more project I'll quickly touch in on is called Person Plant Rock. For this project, I joined a geology class of undergrads at Portland State University again, and we went out to the Alvord Desert in um, kind of central Southern Oregon, right at the foot of the Steens Mountain. It's this giant kind of dry playa. It's a really, really remarkable place um, for thousands of years, was home to the Northern Paiute. And the site itself is really beautiful. When I joined the class, I knew nothing about geology, like nothing about geology. And I teamed up with John Bershaw as the artist in residence. And what I was really thinking about was how geologists see time. It's not something I've really talked about in this presentation, but there's this underlying theme of time that runs through my work and specifically how I think about place. And I think that has to do with history and it has to do with expanding the time frame in which we're thinking about things in order to tell kind of richer and truer histories. In this case, geology students typically are not asked to think about deep time and geologic time in the future. They're asked to think about the, the, the past. And what I asked them to do was create a series of drawings, one of which was of the present day of a spot in the landscape they would choose, one of them to draw the landscape 20 million years in the past, which for them would be a relatively small timeline to look back and then 20 million years into the future. And that future piece was really what I was interested in. And asking them to look at an extension of time that normally they wouldn't be. And I was super curious about their perspective on it as people who are seeing these geologic forces of which I'm not. This is another way also of thinking about interpretation. The way I think about it here is that you think about this, that, that for geologists, there's always interpretation happening. They're able to look, this is happening with all of us, but the example for this is they're, they're able to look at a landscape and they're reading these really vast forces and periods of time that have formed this. So they're constantly kind of taking it apart and reassembling it. That was super interesting to me and it became evocative of what we're all doing all the time when we see things, right? There's always a process of an internal interpretation where we're looking at something and we're trying to understand it at a basic level or we already understand it. The drawing that came out of this that I was really thinking about, this is another one overlaid that's 20 million years in the future. And this kind of beautiful sketch is of a forest, of a future forest. So the layered element in this illustration is imagining what I would call a biological future. So this deep time future in which this dry playa is again a forest. And to be able to think in those terms and in that way with that depth was really fascinating to me. And to think about a future that wasn't just rock, even though in a lot of ways, predominantly those geologic elements are what geologists are kind of trained to look for.
when I'm thinking about this idea of how we're interpreting things as kind of an internal process, if I think about the geology class, for example, one of the things I was also interested in introducing was in that case, a shorter period of time and a personal experience. So part of the kind of game for me of doing this work is simply shifting a lens that people are using and kind of seeing what happens. So if the geologists are looking at these huge time periods, one of the things we also did on that trip is we, I like focus them in on a primary experience. Like I asked them to, I asked them to write a hundred observations of that moment. And we kind of did it until they came up with a hundred observations. And what it got down to was these extremely micro noticings of like the wind on their face or a grain of sand. And um, it was a way of me playing with kind of what the content was that they were interpreting. We also started to talk about human timelines, which aren't typical. So looking at indigenous history of the area, looking at uh, European white settlement early on and really thinking about these other aspects that typically um, those, th those folks in particular on a geology, in a geology class would not typically be being asked to do. So this idea of kind of how we're defining place and what it's made of is really central to my interest in this work. And kind of playing with that content of where personal memory interacts with the various histories that are written and unwritten for a place and how that interacts with the spirit of a place. So the kind of hope for the work that I'm doing in a lot of ways is kind of thinking about this complexity and proposing ideas for how we get to know a place. And that can range from these really simple tasks like I've been talking about early on in the presentation about Strassel Farm that involved making a walking stick or listening to bird song or interpreting place class where what we're really doing is about developing an interpretive experience for someone else in a much bigger way. And so I think kind of across this gamut, um, I'm hoping it kind of grounds itself in those kinds of explorations to start to see the kind of richness that is always there in these places that we're either conscious to or not, and often kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, thank you so much, Jordan. Um, does anyone ha else have any questions? We're just kind of wrapping up now as we move into break before oh, the- Oh, I actually forgot. So after all this, I forgot that it's actually a 350 wrap up. So that's the absurdity of the situation. Um, I see, we can stop. I see one question from Matt. I can follow up with you separately about that, Matt, but thank you. I appreciate it. The translation of Bird Sounds Project, which is true, dear to my heart. Jordan, will you talk a little bit about um, how you see us like classroom assignments as being art projects? Sure. Um, I, I love working with this idea of assignments. And I think part of that is thinking about multiple perspectives, how different people look at the same thing. Um, and so this idea of multiples is fascinating to me and kind of central to a lot of my art practice. And so that's, that's one way of answering it or maybe a, a big way. Um, the other aspect of how it relates to my art practice, a, a teaching practice is that there is a this is like, like the crude version is like, I get paid to do my art. Like I get paid to make art, that's really hard to do. And so if I think about these two roles as merged, kind of that becomes almost part of the game. I also think it allows me, um, I'm hoping a different kind of freedom also to work with students around their interests within these contexts to create this broader container. And I think it creates projects that can also enter the world in a new way. And for example, the historic markers piece even has become a collaboration, even though it came out of an assignment with students that continue, right? I'm in dialogue with them. I'm delivering them to their homes. We're having these additional conversations. And so using this kind of artistic practice within the context of a classroom can really help open these, these other deeper relationships that I'm interested in. Um. 
Looks like we have an, uh, one more question in the chat from Matt. I'd love to hear about a place that you personally connect with, how it came into your life. Oh my, it's like opening it up at the very, in the last five minutes. Um, there's a stumbled on piece of this. I, I think I would say that. Um, there's one place I'm speak I always think of, or I thought of immediately, which is in the San Lorenzo Mountains outside of Santa Cruz. And, um, and I don't have a good story for why it's that way, but it's, and, and I kind of mentioned uh, this matrix of things that make up a place. And that is very much a place that I would describe as imbued with spirit. Um, I went there, I fell in love with it, and I return to it every time I go to the central coast of California. And I can't explain why, um, but I think that's part of um, the kind of the mystery of place and, and how this whole thing works. Jordan, I have a quick question for you. Regarding your earlier uh, statement about approaching land or a place as a guest, where have you found yourself verging on contradiction to that? Ver verging on contradiction in terms of, you say a little bit more, just quickly? Perhaps becoming less of a guest and more of a uh, resident. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great, interesting question for sure. Good question, Zach. I think that the question of guesthood is always there. And I think it's for me, and I think especially being a non-Indigenous person living on Indigenous land, I think this question of guesthood is always there um, in some way, in some background. I mean, that said, of course, like I think that's one way that it's present in how I think about being places here. Um, and I think what I just described at the same time was this aspect of the question about a personal place of meaning from that, which is that that's a totally different sense of belonging that, that it can exist at the same time, right? And the sense of belonging that from my perspective can come about from understanding all of the nuance of place. Um, so like the more I get to understand a place, uh, the more belonging to it I, I feel, um, hope that kind of fit in there, Zach. Well, thank you so much everyone. And thank you so much, Jordan, for your graduate lecture. Um, we have our next event in two minutes with Emma and her plants, which was gonna be exciting. So thank you everyone.